Now, for those of you who are new to this Hebrew study, this is going to be very important to hear, otherwise you will get lost, all right? Now, this has been very fun. Yeah. This has been very fun as long as you follow along yeah. and wrote notes and remember, all right? So it will be a big blessing if you can keep doing that. So make sure that you retain it, okay? Retain the information. Now, to remind you, the book of Hebrews, the background of the author is the Apostle Paul, and it's likely that he wrote it during his time in Arabia. So during that time, remember, the Jews were being ministered to, not the Gentiles yet. So the apostles preaching and teaching is a Jewish teaching. This is the book of Hebrews. To the Jews, they're expecting the kingdom to happen any moment, the rapture and the tribulation to happen. So there is tribulation doctrine for Jews. That is what Paul is familiar with as he's writing to the Hebrews. But he's at the same time being introduced doctrine about the body of Christ to the Gentiles. That doctrine is Christian doctrine, church age doctrine, which we have today. So as he's receiving this, remember, he doesn't have a grasp of Christian body of Christ doctrine yet. So he's likely giving tribulation doctrine throughout this book. But within that writing, there's some Christian doctrine mingled in there. The reason why he's just being introduced to that. So he doesn't yet know the distinctions yet. He doesn't yet know the division about uh, the Jews who are undergoing the tribulation. This will be after the church age, which is today what we're undergoing. He doesn't know that we're, we've, went, we've undergone 2,000 years under the times of the Gentiles, under the church age. He doesn't know that yet. God was still dealing with the Jews that time, remember. So it's a mingling of that. Remember, it's mainly Hebrew doctrine, the timeline tribulation. But there's some Christian doctrine mingled in there. So then, in these verses, our job is to find out which one is tribulation and which one will be Christian. Sometimes one verse can split in half where half of it could be tribulation, the other half could be Christian. That's very common in Bible, especially prophecy and end times. You have to split verses in half. And the evidence are the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. When there's a verse prophesying about the coming of Jesus Christ the Messiah, the entire chapter is not about Jesus the Messiah. Sometimes the entire chapter could be about the psalmist or the Old Testament saint or the nation of Israel. But all of a sudden, the Messiah is inserted in there, all of a sudden, without notice. So that's common in the Bible. That's proper biblical hermeneutics. You won't get this in other churches, only Bible-believing churches who believe in this kind of dispensationalism and the King James only issue. All right? So you're not going to, I guarantee you're not going to get in churches in the Bay Area. I'm pretty certain of that much. But Bible-believing churches, there's a lot of us out there, but it's not as lot as you think. All right? We're a minority still. So it's important to understand that. Now that we understand it, let's figure out from these verses which one is Christian, which one is tribulation, and also sometimes a verse, even though it's tribulation doctrine, it could also work for Christian, okay? And then another thing is, Paul might have meant to write it for tribulation for one verse, but God actually sees it as, actually, you don't know this, Paul, but that's church age Christian. You just don't know that. So remember that, okay? General epistles, Hebrews to Jude, are the most confusing books in your Bible because those deal with Jewish Christian doctrines. So that's important to understand. Now, let's have fun with this, okay? There's a group called hyper-dispensationalists. They don't believe <coughs> you can find any Christian application in the general epistles. We fervently deny that. 
Hyper-dispensationalists think that everything is tribulation epistle. So then if you get wonderful promises that Christians claim in the general epistles, hyper-dispensationalists will claim, no, 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 that's not for Christians. Those are for Jews in the tribulation. One, one infamous example is confessing sins yeah. under the blood of Christ. That's a daily practice for Christians we should do. But hyper-dispensationalists say, oh, no, 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 that's not for Christians. Those are for Jews in the tribulation because that's found in the general epistle. And hyper-dispensationalists think that general epistles are only for Jews in the tribulation. That's not true. Bible-believing dispensationalists, not hyper-dispensationalists, believe you can find Christian and Jewish doctrines in the general epistles. People who are not dispensationalists or don't know much about dispensationalism they will use general epistles and apply everything to Christians. And that's dangerous because there's so many verses about losing salvation that works are combined with faith. Why is that? Because in the tribulation, you can't take the mark of the beast. You can't deny Christ. That's a lot of work involved over there. You have to work hard for your salvation, not follow the Antichrist system. So. That's why you'll hear so many churches pull up verses from Hebrews to prove that Christians can lose their salvation or they weren't genuinely saved. Now, we will come to these verses and prove them wrong. We're going to show you these are tribulation Jewish doctrines. At the same time, we will debunk hyper-dispensationalists where there are certain verses that are clearly more in line with Christian, uh, Christian doctrine than tribulation. Now that's the background and layout. See that? That's a, that's a mouthful, right? All right. My advice is please start from Hebrews chapter 1 in our commentary. Then it'll be much easier. But for those of you, if this is new, this is a mouthful. So try to remember everything and follow as best as you can. Okay? Here we go. Now Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 2, excuse me. Hebrews chapter 2. We didn't finish this. So the last part is verse 17 through 18, verse 17 through 18. Did I mention about Jesus Christ acting as high priest interceding on the behalf for the tribulation saints? Did I mention that part or no? Do you recall? I don't think so. Okay, why don't I do that then, okay? So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. All right, all right I believe I did explain this, but I'll review it just in case, all right? So let me explain each and every word in these verses. All right, so as I explain, look at the verse. Just please look at the verse. See if my explanations match every word here, okay? So in other words, in verse 17 through 18, the idea is that's why in everything it was fitting. That's what behoved mean. It was fitting for Jesus to be made like to his brethren, his family his brothers and sisters. So that's referring to God's family, spiritual family, all right? So Jesus Christ, in other words, was it was fitting for him to become a human. That's the idea. So that he can become a high priest, a high priest who is merciful over humans' sins, faithful to intercede over human sins because he was once a human himself. That's why he can do that job. So as a high priest, he takes care of things that pertain or that has to do with the things of God so that he can reconcile. Reconcile means to make two opposing parties into one. So he's trying to unite or reconcile these contrary parties, which is God and people together. So Jesus Christ is reconciling for the sins of the people. For, so that's his spiritual family. Because, based on the reason that Jesus Christ himself went through the same sufferings like we did in temptation. So he fully understands. That's why he can be merciful and faithful as high priest. 
So that's why he is able. He has the ability to succor them. Succor means to aid, to help those who undergo temptation. Now, I believe I did cover this, but I'll just make it very gr brief, okay? So when, you, so when Paul was writing to the tribulation saints, it's possible that he was thinking that these Jews, as they undergo the tribulation, because Jesus Christ died on the cross for them, he is able to intercede on their behalf as high priest. That's very different from the Old Testament where they had to have a human high priest offer animal sacrifices. In the tribulation, you're not gonna be as lucky to do that. You have to run for the hills and hide and survive. So then, that's why the author is writing, you can have a high priest Jesus. This can happen in the spiritual realm. So whatever Satan accuses the tribulation saints, the Jews during the tribulation, over their sins, Jesus Christ will be a merciful high priest to intercede on their behalf, to help them conquer temptation. The verses are 1 John chapter, th uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. All right, we won't turn there because we covered it last time. He is the high priest. He's a faithful advocate in the courtroom interceding for their sins. 1 John is a general epistle, so that has tribulation application. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation is a book on the tribulation. Satan is known as the accuser of the brethren. So see, Satan's accusing those tribulation saints during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 3. Again, a book on the tribulation. God promised that to a local church, all right, so remember, church means called out assembly. So a local called out assembly during the tribulation, they can escape the hour of temptation as that tribulation is undergoing in the book of Revelation. See that? So Christ is succoring them throughout temptations. So those are the three verses that match it up. But we've, when we honestly look at verse 17 through 18, when, if you and I were to look at that, we would, in our minds, we would obviously first think Christians, wouldn't we? Not tribulation Jews. So that's why verse 17 and 18 has better application to Pauline epistles, to Christian doctrine, rather than tribulation Jews. So remember, again, the author might be writing about Jews undergoing tribulation. He had that in mind historically, but doctrinally, God is seeing that as, no, whether you know it or not, that's for church age. That's the same thing, remember, with messianic prophecies. The psalmist, when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Historically, he might be thinking about himself undergoing persecution and suffering, but God is seeing doctrinally that that is for the Messiah who gives out the same cry. Okay, so remember that. Now, anyways... This fits better with Christian doctrine. And all these verses, you want to remember this. Okay, you see all this? This box right here? From Hebrews 2, 11 through 18, we see more of Pauline epistle doctrine, not Hebrew uh, tribulation doctrine. All right, we see more of that. It's possible. It could apply to tribute and we've seen that, right? But we see more leaning toward Christian doctrine here. So the hyper-dispensationalists, if they say you cannot claim the promises of verse 11 through 18, you call them a liar because in their Pauline epistles, which hyper-dispensationalists love, you show them in their Pauline epistles, it matches with the book of Hebrews. Right. So we can claim those promises at Hebrews. So these green uh, verses are Pauline epistles that you want to write down, all right? We're not, we already looked at them uh, before, all right? So we're not going to look at them again. But this last one we didn't see, okay? So the last one we're going to take a look at, and this is my favorite promise. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 10 and Philippians 4 and Romans 8. So two of them, excuse me, verse 17 and 18. So Romans 8, 
1 Corinthians 10 and Philippians 4. If you came here to learn the Bible, then you will get what you came here for, all right? So we will go through so many verses, all right? You will get what you came here for. So go to Philippians chapter 4. The other one is 1 Corinthians 10. And then the other one is Romans chapter 8. All right. So let's first of all look at Jesus Christ being a faithful high priest interceding for our behalf on our sins. So Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, Paul writes, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh what? An intercession for us. So see, he's interceding. He's reconciling as he's uh, interceding for the sins of the people. Remember Hebrews 1 and 2. It mentioned before about Christ sitting on the right hand of God. He, and he's being our priest. So that matches with the language of Romans 8. So we see Pauline here. We see Pauline. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So Jesus Christ, God, gave a promise that he will succor us throughout temptations. Amen. He understands what we went through because he went through it. That's why he won't give us a temptation greater than we can bear. He understands our limitations. He'll provide us a way to escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. That matches with Hebrews, right? Faithful, merciful high priest, right? who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Remember, Christ suffered the same, same temptations we went through. So he's going to make sure that he doesn't suffer us to go through something beyond our capacity. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. All right, Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Now this is cool. Verse 19. But my God, verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now you might ask me, now pastor, how does that match with Hebrews about Jesus Christ helping us with temptation? Oh, friend, uh, you forgot Hebrews 2.18, succor them that are tempted. What does succor mean? Aid, provide during their time of need. So during your hour of need and temptation this is something to shout about man yeah, during your hour of need of temptation god gave a promise that he'll supply all your needs Amen. that's just that's not just the, you know the needs that you pray for that god will provide for you no this is including your temptations yeah, amen, so d during your temptation he's going to provide your need yes. Yes. according to his riches richly He's going to richly provide the need. He will succor. He will aid you. That way you can get out of temptation. That's true. Now that's a wonderful promise. Yes. Bible-believing Christians can claim Hebrews 2.18 for themselves. And if a hyper-dispensationalist says, no, that's not for you, that's for Jews in the tribulation, then you can ignore them. They sap away the precious promises of God for, for, for you Christians. So totally ignore them, all right? They're heresies. All right, go to Hebrews 3. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the, uh, so then the writer, the author writes, that's why, brethren, you're holy. So he calls them holy. Yes. Why are they holy? Because they partake. They are a part of God's heavenly calling. So, are you part of the heavenly calling of God? Amen. You and I are. That's why you and I are considered to be holy. Holy. Now, think about this. So, Christians can claim, verse 1, now let's see the tribulation side. If the author is writing to tribulation Jews, why are they considered holy? They're considered holy as partakers of the heavenly calling because... They keep enduring because they keep uh, working for their salvation. Uh, the verse that would uh, show this uh, partaker of the heavenly calling is if we look at verse 6, uh, verse 14, 14. 
for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You see that? That endurance. How many cults have told Christians you got to endure to the end to be saved? That's heresy. Christians do not endure to the end. Jesus Christ did all the work for us. He did the end work for us. We're saved by faith. So who endures to the end? What is known as end times? See, tribulation. That wording end is tribulation. So obviously, Jews in the tribulation have to endure all the way to the end because they have to resist the Antichrist. They have to resist the mark, resist persecution, starvation. So they're considered holy. They're partakers of the heavenly calling as long as they endure to the end. See that? Okay. So that's why they're considered to be holy. But for us Christians, we're holy because our partaking of the heavenly calling is by salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Now, um, let's look at, I'll explain that more, okay? I'll explain that more when we come to verse 6, okay? And maybe verse 14. But let's go to the next part of Hebrews 3.1. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profess profession, Christ Jesus. Yeah. So whether uh, Paul is writing to tribulation Jews or to Christians. The point is, it can apply to both. He is writing to saved believers, saying that you should consider the capital apostle and the capital high priest of our profession. So we hear a thing, they profess to be saved Christians, right? So that's what profession means, is that you label yourself, you profess to be a saved believer. So, uh, the profession of say believers, Jesus Christ is our apostle and high priest of that. That is Christ Jesus. So notice that the prince of the apostles is not the pope here. Right? The capital apostle is not the pope. Catholic Church always says that. No, they're stealing Jesus Christ's title. That is utter blasphemy. If a pope claims to be the capital apostle on earth, he is blaspheming Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ's title. There's a second thing the Catholic Church blasphemed and stole Jesus Christ's title, and that is John 17. John 17. The second title that they stole from Jesus, uh, from God himself, from God himself, is Holy Father. Holy Father should never be given, absolutely never given, to a priest or a pope who are godless sinners themselves. Godless sinners themselves. So go to John 17, verse 11. Jesus said, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee who? Holy Father. Holy Father, keep through thine own name. Okay, that's given only to deity. A pope, how dare he takes that for himself, all right? Go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, and then verse 2. So the two titles that the pope has stolen is the capital apostle, as well as Holy Father. You want to note that. Yeah. They stole Hebrews 3 and John 17 for themselves. Verse 2, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So, verse 2, so remember, pay attention to my explanation. See if it matches the verse. So, Jesus Christ was faithful to God the Father, who appointed him as the high priest who appointed him as the one, as a leader over the household, just like God did with Moses. And he appointed Moses as leader. And Moses, like Jesus, was faithful in all of his house. So out of everybody in his home, Moses was the one that was faithful. Now, uh, the house that's referring to here is household, not a, um, a building, okay? Now, uh, what you're going to, let's see right here. You're going to see right here that uh, Hebrews chapter 3, G, uh, the author is going to compare the superiority of Christ to Moses, all right? How Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. From what we saw at, remember, Hebrews 2 and 3, is Jesus Christ's superiority over angels, all right? So we saw Jesus Christ's superiority over angels at Hebrews 1 through 2. Now the author is going down to Jesus Christ's superiority over Moses. 
So in his so angels, the superiority of Christ is over the angels. And now we come to Moses. In Moses, you want to keep in mind that the author is going to talk a lot about the house here. And he's going to compare Moses' house and Jesus' house. And obviously we know Jesus is superior to Moses by house. The house right here is going to have two definitions you want to write down. If you don't write this down, if you don't keep this in mind, you're going to be confused, all right? When we get to Hebrews 3, it's going to get deep, okay? So that's why follow along with me. So the house here is two definitions. It's going to be a household. That's what you're going to notice most of the time. But you're going to notice it is a literal place, okay? So building is not really the uh, accurate answer. I'm going to say place. Place is better, okay? Or home. I think home is better, all right? So a home. It's a place or a home. So it's a household and a home. You're going to see that over and over again in Hebrews 3. And as we get to Hebrews 4, that was in the author's mind. You're going to see that, okay? So for Moses' house, it's pretty obvious. It's referring to the whole Jews there, his nation, his people. So Moses was faithful in all of Israel. That's the idea, over the people of Israel. And then Jesus, you're going to find out he was faithful above all of God's children. Yeah, that's, right. that's what it means by his house here. Now, we're going to look at Two verses, Acts 16 and Hebrews 11. Acts 16 and Hebrews 11. These two passages point out that house is referring to household. It doesn't have to necessarily be a home all the time or a building. It's going to be a household. Go to Hebrews 11 and Acts chapter 16. Hebrews 11 and Acts chapter 16. So let's start off with Acts chapter 16 and then verse 31, Acts chapter 16. And then uh, we'll look at verse 31. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy what? House. house. So this is referring to household, obviously. It's not referring to you'll be saved and you're building. No, that's obvious. It's referring uh, to... Uh, his family, to the household. Okay, uh, it looks like I was wrong. It wasn't Hebrews 11. I thought it would be Hebrews 11. Excuse me? Okay, thank you. Hebrews chapter 11. Yes, you're right. Thank you. All right, then. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. All right. The Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his what? Now, obviously, Noah built an ark to save his family, his household, yeah. not his building, all right? I don't think he moved the building inside the ark, okay? All right, let's go back to Hebrews 3, <laughs> Hebrews 3. All right, so understanding that it's going to be household, but you can see a home, a building. You're going to see that a little later on, all right? So let's look at Hebrews 3, verse 3. For this man, that's referring to Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. So Jesus is counted. He is seen, accounted as more worthy and having, uh, he is deserving of more glory and praise than Moses himself. Why? Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Inasmuch, meaning that based on the reason, reason why, so inasmuch, if you space that out, it would mean in as much. So that's what it means. In as much as the one who's a builder of homes is obviously the one who should receive more honor than the home or the household itself because they're the provider. That's the idea. They're the builder of it. Verse 4, for every house is builded by some man. Because every house, so we see right here it's a building, okay? It's a place. It's not a household. Is builded by uh, somebody, okay? That's the idea. But he that built all things is God. However, God is superior than humans because God built everything. 
not just a house, not just a location. Now, this is one of the best verses next to Hebrews 1. Now, notice this is written to Hebrews, right? If Paul was writing to Hebrews, he'd like to prove Jesus is God to them. We saw that at Hebrews 1, but the next best verse is Hebrews 3. So I think in the Jehovah Witness Bible, you can use this on them too. But think about this. Who's the one who builds a house at Hebrews 3.3? Uh, 3? That's Jesus, isn't it? Okay. Who's the one that's the builder at Hebrews 3.4? God. So Jesus is God. How about that? That's, that's one of the next best verses you want to mark down. All right? So it proves right here Jesus has to be God. All right, verse 5. And Moses verily, uh, so uh, let's see right here, we see that the builder is Jesus Christ. That's why he's superior in his house above Moses. You'll notice that, all right? Greater than, okay? You'll notice that in this whiteboard here. Now, Verse 5, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house. Meaning, Moses was surely, certainly the faithful perf person in all his household, his people, Israel, as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So he was, he served the people as a good servant. And he became a good testimony of what? Where people or things would be spoken about him after his life. And that is very true. We see that with Jesus Christ, right, constantly. So we'll look at John 5. Jesus Christ, who is superior to Moses, used Moses' testimony for his backup. So Moses became a testimony to Jesus as well. We're going to look at Mo, uh, John chapter 5, and then uh, verse 46. 46, John 5, 46. Jesus said, For had he believed Moses, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if he believed not his writings, how shall he believe my words? Okay, so Moses became a testimony for Jesus. All right. Go to Hebrews 3. Yeah, ain't that something? That's good, yeah. 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 Amen. Imagine Jesus, his testimony that he could use is Moses. Amen. Wow, that's amazing. And wouldn't God like to use your, wouldn't that be great that God uses your testimony? That's right, preacher. That's a sermon right there. I could make that the rest of our Hebrews class. Yeah, yeah. I'll make a sermon about God using your testimony. That's something. Yeah. All right, verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house whose house are we? So notice right here that the author says, but, so he's contrasting Moses' faithfulness, that Jesus Christ is better than Moses' faithfulness. So Jesus Christ is a son over his own household, his family. Because remember, God is the Father, all right? We got the Father and then God the Son. So Jesus Christ is considered to be the Son in the family and the household and we can be a part of the family of God as well God's children okay if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end so cults use this verse to prove that Christians must endure to the end notice right here it says we can be a part of God's family based on if if we hold on to it, hold fast. We don't lose it. What does that mean, you don't lose it? That means you can lose it then. A lot of people, a lot of Christians try to get around Hebrews 4, 3, 6, that this is not talking about losing salvation. No, hold fast means that you can lose it. So that's why you have to hold on to it because it can be lost. So you can lose the salvation. The confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. Firm. So you, uh, whatever this confidence and rejoicing of the hope is, which we can obviously see as salvation, but we have to hold on to it firmly. All right? You got to grab it hard all the way to the end. All right. Now, 
Uh, this confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, we're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 5. Now, notice what the scripture says when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Okay, remember, we are a part of God's house, correct? Mm -hmm. What did Paul say to Christians? He actually said, you can't lose it. Yeah. It's sealed. It's locked. So you, don't have, so you can't lose it. Sealed means it's locked. Okay, so look at 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, right? We're, part, uh, we're dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Yeah. Now we're part of God's house, right? Yeah. All right, now look at this. Notice right here, verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always what? Confident. confident. Okay, that matches with Hebrews, the confidence, right? All right, now let me write this. That way you don't get lost, okay? So remember, it talks about uh, the confidence and rejoicing of the hope. Now, what you're going to see right here, it's going to refer to your salvation and being raptured up to heaven. Amen. Okay? That's what it's referring to, your salvation and being raptured up to heaven. Amen. That, they go hand in hand with this one. We're going to see that. Okay? So I'm going to show you... Uh, those verses. So notice right here, that's why we're confident, because we go to heaven. See that? So rapture, salvation can all go align right here, going to heaven. Notice that this is talking about going to heaven, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are what? Absent from the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident. There's your confidence. I, again, I say I'm willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the what? Lord. So that's referring to going to heaven. All right, so that's what the confidence is referring to. So that's our house, that's our building. Based on what? Verse 5 said, earnest of the Spirit, right? Amen. That's based on the earnest of the Spirit. Remember that, because go to Ephesians 1. Amen. Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 1.13. Some of you are Bible believers, so you already know the verse. Some of you can guess the verse. Ephesians 1.13, 1 1.13. Now, did you do this? Verse 13, notice there's no enduring, holding fast, no working. It's just believing on Christ, faith. Ephesians 1.13, in whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed. Did you do that? Notice right here, ye were what? Sealed. So that means you can't lose it if it's sealed. Yes. All right, it's locked. So you don't have to, I got a hold. No, 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 God sealed it. Amen. Based on what? Verse 4, uh, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the what? Yes. Earnest. Yeah. See that? So if you, receive, if you are part of the house of God, you have the earnest of the Spirit, correct? Mm -hmm. How do you get the earnest of the Spirit? Simply believing. Yeah. No holding fast. Right. If you have the earnest of the Spirit, you are automatically sealed. Right. Well, what if I sin? What if I sin? You can't lose it because look at, uh, look, uh, keep your hand here at Ephesians 1. Go to Ephesians 4.30. Right. Ephesians 4.30. You can sin all you want, but you, you're still sealed. That's right. You can't lose it. So this is very different from Hebrews. He, he, uh, Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. See that? So you grie you're grieving God with your sins. Yeah. Yep. The next part reads, Whereby ye are what? Sealed. sealed unto the day of redemption. See, you're sealed all the way to when? It says the day of redemption. Sealed. Ephesians 1, 14, go back there. Yeah. You're sealed up to when? 
which is the earnest of our inheritance until the what? Redemption, redemption of the purchased possession. What is this redemption Amen. that you're sealed all the way to? That is the rapture. Wow. So from now to the rapture, you're sealed all the way. Amen. Don't worry about, you know, I got to hold on to it because I could lose it. No, you're sealed. Yeah. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Now, you'll notice that the churches, they don't teach you this thing. Why isn't dispensationalism taught? See, they don't teach this. There's a clear difference with the doctrine in Hebrews for Jews in tribulation versus Christians in the church age. No doubt about it. Go to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, look at the language again. Romans chapter 8. Verse 19. 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature, that's us, waiteth for the what? Manifestations, Manifestations of the sons of God. Oh, we want to be transformed, right? Yeah. So that's when are we transformed? That's the rapture, obviously. Yeah. Our body will be transformed. Notice that the redemption and the transformation of the body is mentioned at verse 23. Yeah. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Remember, we have the earnest of the Spirit. We have the Spirit sealed within us. Yeah. This is all about the rapture. Keep reading. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the what? Redemption, Redemption of our body. Yeah. This is not just your soul yeah. salvation. Come this on. is your body right. being transformed Woo! to be the Son of God when you go to heaven. That's no doubt the rapture. So it's the redemption of the body. So when the Bible says spirit seals you to the day of redemption, that's the rapture. Romans 8 says you receive the spirit in you, matching the earnest of the spirit, matching the sealing of the spirit. And it says that you will get the redemption of the body, the rapture. Now notice that the hope, the rejoicing of the hope is the rapture. Because look at verse... Uh, 20, verse 20, hope is mentioned here. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in what? That's why we call the rapture the blessed hope. Yes. That's why you hear Christians calling the rapture the blessed hope. Notice verse 24, 24. For we are saved by what? Hope. hope. See, the whole context is a rapture here. So that's why the confidence of going to heaven up to getting raptured in heaven based on the hope, confidence and rejoicing of the hope. That term has to do with going to heaven. And how you go to heaven is two things. You're saved and you get raptured. See that? Yeah. So th that's why these two things, salvation and rapture, go hand in hand with confidence and rejoicing of the hope. Because the whole bottom point of the author is going to heaven. That's the idea. Going to heaven. Now, another one is 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. Notice the rejoicing of the hope that has to do with Christ's coming, the coming of Christ, the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is our what? Oh, hope is mentioned. Or joy, or crown of what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Yeah. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, what? At his coming. See that? There's no doubt. That matches with the author of Hebrews right here, the label. There's no doubt. Yeah. From scripture to scripture, this is what he's talking about. Going to heaven. Yeah. Going to heaven. Which is referring to salvation. And when you die, you go to heaven. Or you get raptured and you go to heaven. That's the whole bottom line. Confidence and rejoicing of the hope has to do with going to heaven. So when we go back to Hebrews 3, notice right here that you have to, in Hebrews 3, 6, you have to hold fast, see, that entrance into heaven. Because we're talking about Jesus' house, right? All right, we're following so far? So the author is talking about God's children can enter Jesus' house, which is his family, but also his what? Home. So it means the children of God going to heaven. So to do that, they have to hold that fast. But notice us Christians, we don't have that. 
All right, we're sealed. All right, we're already sealed. But then right here, they have to hold fast. Why? They say that verse 6 is, talk, is not talking about losing salvation. That's ridiculous. What does hold fast mean? It means you can lose something. That's what holding fast is. <laughs> if you tell someone by common sense, hold that thing tight, yeah, yeah. the intention was don't drop yeah, it. Exactly. Don't lose it. Okay? So the author is warning about losing or dropping salvation. That matches with Matthew 24. So go to Matthew 24. Notice you have to endure to the end. Notice the wording of Matthew 24. It matches with Hebrews 3, 6. It matches with that wording. Hold fast to the end. Notice Matthew 24, 13. Endure to the end. See that? That wording's tribulation. The end, Christian. Matthew 24, 13. But he that endure unto the what? End. The same shall be saved. That's not Christian. This is tribulation. You want evidence? The evidence is verse, uh, let's see right here, 29. Immediately after the what? Tribulation. tribulation. That's tribulation. Look at verse 21. 21. For then shall be great what? Tribulation. tribulation. See, that's referring to the tribulation time period. They have to endure to the end because of, it's all chaos. It's all Antichrist, 666. So they have to hold on to their salvation. That entrance to go to heaven, they have to hold it fast. They have to hold it fast. Why? Because their hand can get that 666. So they got to hold to their salvation rather than getting the mark. See, this is making sense here. All right, go back to Hebrews. Now, who told you Bible study is boring, huh? All right. Go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. All right, so what we see right here then is that from starting at verse 6, this is tribulation Jew. This is not Christian then. See that? So the context, and from what we see, is going to be tribulation Jew. Look at verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Meaning, the author is saying that's why the Holy Ghost said today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. All right? Don't be stubborn. As in the, what? That time where the Jews provoked God during their time of temptation, their trial, wandering in the wilderness. So we can guess right here that this is easily referring to the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now here is where the fun begins. What we talked about was not the fun part. This is the fun part. And we're not going to cover everything tonight, which means you have to come next Wednesday, okay? So, which means all of you have to come next Wednesday if you want the fun part. All right. Now, right more or left or what? Right? Rob. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, right, right, right. Right. Good? More? Yeah, that's good. All right, right here? Yeah. Okay, then. All right, terms you need to know. You need to remember these terms or you're going to get lost in Hebrews 3 and 4. Okay, this is very important. It took me a while to understand the context of the author. All right, so today, right? That's what the author said. What you're going to find out what today means is now because it's a limited time. Basically, you got to do it now because the time that God has given to you is limited. We don't know how long, but wherever the time God has given to you, it's, it has an end. It's limited. There's not a next time. There's not another day or another time God will give it to you. So you got to do it now. That's the idea you want to remember because we're going to see that. That's the whole point of the author. We're going to see. The other one uh, that you want to know, uh, let's see right here. Okay, I already explained what today is. So before I continue on, so he is quoting from Psalm 95. You want to go there, Psalm 95. Now Hebrews is filled with the Holy Spirit is God and Jesus Christ is God. The deity, the trinity is God. 
You want evidence? The Jehovah Witness Bible, I believe, still has it. So if you look at Hebrews 3, 7, who's speaking? The Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Ghost is speaking. The author is quoting from Psalm 95. That's what he's writing about. And look who's speaking. A Psalm 95, verse 7. Verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will what? Hear, Hear his voice. voice. Of who? God. At verse 7. God. God's voice. Harden not your heart as in the provocation as the day of temptation in the wilderness. I thought the Holy Ghost said that. But the psalmist said it was God, proving the Holy Ghost is God. Amen. Wow. Already in one lesson tonight, <laughs> we saw Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God. All right? Amen. Now, keep your hand at Psalm 95. We're going to go there a lot. Okay? So go to Hebrews 3 again. Verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do alway err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Okay, pay attention to how, how I explain every word in the verses. Verse 9. So the author is continuing the quote from Psalm 95. That time that they were wandering in the wilderness, that's the when he's referring to. That time when your forefathers, the Jews, see that? Your fathers. Yeah, so that's, that's Jew. Yeah. They ain't Christian, all right? This is Jews right here. So your forefathers, what? Tested out God. That's what tempted means. It means to test. Proved me. So they try to uh, they test him, check him out. Even though they saw everything that he did, all his miracles, his works for the past 40 years. So God was, his patience was being tried, see? They were trying his patience, even though he proved his power all the time. So the author is pointing out by context at verse 7 and 8, see again, that don't be stubborn like those Jews wandering in the wilderness. Make, that's why today, right now, hearken to him, listen to him. Don't be stubborn. Don't try his patience and then say, well, I won't believe it until this, until that. Stop being an atheist. All right? God has proven everything over and over again. That's why in verse 10, that's why I myself, God said, was grieved with that generation, those, that Jewish generation in the wilderness. So that's why he told them and he said to himself, hey, they're always going to err. That means make errors. They're always going to make mistakes in their heart. And they never knew my ways, my miracles. They never recognized that. That's why verse 11, so I swore in my anger. Oh, it's one thing that God swears, makes a promise in joy that we can shout about. But it's another thing when God makes a promise in wrath. Yeah. That's scary, in anger. He swore in his wrath that they're not going to, these Jews won't enter into his rest. Okay, so that rest is pretty obvious. <coughs> Those Jews who are entering the promised land, remember God kicked them out of the promised land, right? You're not going to enter, I swore that. So that rest is referring to the promised land. Now, that's rest number one you want to keep in mind. There are, this is the confusion in Hebrews 3 and 4, all right, that nearly 90% of commentators get wrong. It's not one rest to the people of God. You're going to find four different rests from Hebrews 3 through 4. I'm going to show them to you, and there is no doubt about it, you're going to find four rests right there in the Bible. So, we can agree that the rest here is referring to the promised land. That's pretty obvious, all right? For those Jews there, God swore you're not going to enter into there. Now, uh, when we go back to Hebrews 3 again, uh, notice right here, 
Verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. All right, so meaning then, the author is saying, that's why, listen up, brethren, my family, my, Jew, my fellow Jews, uh, lest, unle because what's going to happen, uh, unless there's going to be one of you people who's going to have an evil heart of not believing. See, denying God's miracles, testing, trying him out. And you're going to depart from the living God. You're going to get away from him. Okay, I hope you're uh, looking at the verses while I'm explaining so you can see if it matches, okay? So keep that in mind. So the author is saying that's why you have to every day at verse 13, every day, mm -hmm. encourage each other, uplift each other, support each other. Right. While it, it, God still calls it today. Meaning that while you still have that time, that limited time God gives to you, <laughs> that now moment, while God calls it that, because your time's going to run out, you better keep it up. Okay, you got to exhort one another, encourage each other. Um, because otherwise, verse 13, again, otherwise, if you don't, one of you is going to become hardened. You're, you're going to be stubborn in your hearts. Because sin will trick you. It will deceive you. That's why you have to keep uplifting each other up. You have to keep yourself in check. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Meaning that that's why, uh, by context, uh, you have to keep yourselves in check because we, we are made partakers of Christ, we partake, we are a part of Christ's family, his home, salvation, if we constantly hold on to it, endure from the beginning of our confidence, so from the beginning of our salvation, our entrance to heaven, steadfast, that means holding on to it, it's locked, holding fast. If you hold on to it firmly all the way to the end, all right, that's why the author is saying here to the Jewish people, that's why keep yourselves in check. Because that day is going to run out. So don't think that you'll get a next time. Verse 15, while it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So while God, God or the scriptures keep saying, so in other words, it keeps it open, Today, if you will hear his voice. So while God gives the call, while God's call, the scripture's call is still open, all right? That, that if you will hear me out, if you will hear out God right now, all right, during this limited time that you have. See, that's the reason why I wrote all this. That way you can follow along, okay? You can know what the author's talking about. That's why while you keep hearing his voice, you know, while God gives you, while God's calling opens up that limited time for you, don't harden your hearts. Don't become stubborn. Right. Just like what? Just, as in the provocation. Just like that time that the Jews provoked the Lord during the, back in the wilderness. Yeah. And that's the context of verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. So that's referring to those Jews who provoked the Lord. All right, unfortunately, I have to end it here. I wasn't able to get onto it, okay? But uh, if you come next Wednesday, I promise you this is going to be a lot of fun, all right? Yeah. Well, so I'm going to cover this, the four rests, and then you're going to keep these in mind. Okay, uh, it's too bad. Rats, I want to go to chapter 4, verse 2. 4, verse 2 would have been fun. All right, let's close with the word of prayer. Father God, uh, I pray that tonight's teaching has been eye-opening, yeah. a blessing to your people. Help them understand each and every word from that book. And then open our eyes more to proper doctrine. As we live in a day and age where so many people mess up their doctrines. They foul up their doctrines, Heavenly Father. Uh, and then they teach wrong stuff to Christians nowadays. Uh, dismiss us now with your blessing. Help us to get home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.